I'm waiting for those spinning cycles and it looks like it stopped. So I will welcome everybody today to the Podman community meeting. Today is Thursday, June 6th, 2023. We have a large list of things to go through today. The first thing that we're going to be looking at is the Chris project running in Podman via Podman desktop from Jennings Zhang and Rudolf Pianiella. And I hope I didn't butcher either of your names there for that one. Matt Hien will be talking about the Podman 4.5. And then Dan Walsh, if he's here, I'm not sure there's kind of some question about whether or not he'll be able to make it today. We'll be doing a Quadlet demo. And then the Podman desktop 1.0 update will be given by Stefan Lemire. And then a Podman SH demo will be given by Yokesh at the end. So we've got a pretty full day. We will have time for um, questions if you have some. And with all that, I think I'm going to um, just oh, remind folks that we have a HackMD script, which I'll put a Link to in the chat. If you, I will be taking notes there. If you see that I've done something badly in the notes, please feel free to add. And presenters, if you have links or such that you want to make sure that we have for the notes that will be posted later on the website, please go ahead and add those to the HackMD as we go along. So I'm going to stop presenting now and hand it over to Jennings, who's going to be talking about the Curse Project. All right. Hi, everyone. All right, so my name is Jennings, and I'm supervised by my PI, Rudolf Pinar. Together, we're working on the CRISP project at the Boston Children's Hospital. And our lab does a lot of research on fetal imaging and also newborn imaging, uh, where we use MRI to study very young patients. And so what you see on screen here is an example of uh, what a fetus MRI looks like while it's still in the pregnant mother's uterus. Uh, to do this kind of research, we need a lot of niche open source software uh, because it's a very specialized um, division of medicine. And so what we're working on, the CRISP project, is helping to orchestrate the digital cyber infrastructure to actually be able to run these open source pipelines. Just to give a brief example of what one of these pipelines may be, um, we have a fetal MRI processing pipeline, which is going to take all of these multiple in utero images of varying quality. It's going to try to use some image processing um, algorithms such as masking and quality assessment to finally be able to reconstruct these multiple in utero images into one high quality cropped volume. And what we can do with these processed data is we can try to quantify metrics of the brain while it's developing in utero. And this is what a fetal brain looks like while it's still developing at 25 weeks of gestational age through 32 gestational weeks of age. Using these open source tools, we are able to measure the growth of specific parts of the brain as well and look at the trends as the uh, pregnancy continues. And so the infrastructure that we have at the Boston Children's Hospital is, of course, we have these scanners. We also have um, open, sorry, not open. We have some high performance computing centers, and we also have the office space where our researchers sit. And what the CRISP project does is it connects all of these things together. Uh, researchers can be at their desks looking at the CRIS user interface and they're able to dispatch computational jobs to both our internal high-performance computing center, and we're also able to ship jobs out to our public clouds as well with a hybrid cloud architecture. And so that's a quick demo of, or sorry, a quick introduction on what the CRIS project is. Something that I've been working on recently is being able to run CRIS on Podman, and especially using Podman Desktop. So I'll jump to that. We have a GitHub repository called Minichris K8s. And inside of here, we have several Kubernetes manifests, AKA YAMLs. And I also have a wrapper script called minichris.sh. And what this wrapper script is going to do is it's going to bring together these YAML files into something that can be consumed by Podman Desktop. Let's open up Podman Desktop. 
All right, here it is. Uh, I don't have many containers running. I'm just going to delete this guy. All right, when you want to run a Kubernetes manifest using Podman desktop, it accepts a single Kubernetes file. I have my Kubernetes manifests organized as multiple YAML files here. So this wrapper script called minichris.sh is going to do two things. It's just going to simply concatenate all of my uh, YAMLs together. And it's also going to perform a sed command to just replace some of the values. One key value that it needs to replace, we can take a quick look at it. Yeah, so the function that I'm going to run is going to call, be called mini Chriscat. All it's doing is it's going to be concatenating all of my YAML files, and then it's going to be performing a set operation on two of these variables. And that's just going to replace the hard-coded Podman socket address with what's actually going to be running on my system obtained from the Podman info command. Let's try that. And it's just going to spit the YAML out to my standard out. And I'll type it into a file. And now this file called Chris all in oneyaml can be loaded into Podman Desktop. As it says here with Podman Desktop, this play cube command can take a few minutes to, to complete. And the reason why is because Podman behind the scenes is going to be starting the defined services and deployment sequentially. It's also going to try running in its containers, which does things like database initialization, and that's going to take a little while. Another functionality of my monolithic script over here is that it can monitor Podman for init containers. Oh. That finished faster than I expected it to. I was going to say that we can look at what the init containers are doing, but it seems like everything's up already. So let's just keep going. Yeah, so we can see we have a bunch of pods here. Uh, we have what's known as the cube pod, and that's our Chris backend. Uh, we have PFCon, which is another Chris service that handles the compute that might be dispatched by Chris. Uh, we have the Chris UI, which we'll take a look at later. That's our user interface. Before we can take a look at Chris, I have a script called Chrismatic. Chrismatic, which I can also run using Podman, is going to initialize the Chris system with some information. And that's going to create some users for testing purposes. And it's also going to um, add some programs, or what we call Chris plugins, to the Chris system. And you can see that this mini chris.sh, chrismatic subcommand, is just a podmin run alias. And it's going to run a new container as part of the cube pod. And it's just going to run the chrismatic command within the chrismatic container. What that does is it reads a file called chrismatic.yaml to put a bunch of data into our Chris backend. And so what it's done here is it's created a super user called Chris. And that's going to be a user that we'll log in as in a quick moment. And it has registered a few simple programs for us to try running. To access the user interface, we can see that it's running over here on Podman desktop. Uh, these logs say that it's running on port 3000, though the port 3000 is mapped onto the host port 8020, I believe. Yeah. So let's take a look. This is the Chris user interface. And from here, what we're able to do is we can click login. And yeah, great new analysis. In Chris, we have 
computational experiments organized as separate analyses. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to create a new analysis with some uploaded data. And now what's happening is once I've uploaded the data into the Chris system, we can see it running in this Chris UI. And I can choose to run more plugins here. When I choose to run a plugin, such as this one, I'll just click Add Node, it's going to dispatch a container to Podman, and Podman is going to run it. So if I'm lucky, if I type Podman PS, then it'll show the container running. So I have to be kind of fast. I guess I lied about being the fast part. It always breaks during demos. I have no idea why this guy ran, but this guy doesn't. I'll just try it again. The demo I'll just take the strong. What was that? The demo gods are strong. Yeah, they are. Uh, I can do another quick explanation of what's happening here. And what's happening here is uh, this user interface is pretty much helping me build a command line uh, string that is eventually going to be forwarded to the Podman socket. And so this program that I'm trying to run called Simple DS App is just a demonstration program. We have other programs, as you've seen, for imaging analysis and medical research. I'm just going to pass a command line parameter here called sleep length 10, because I want it to sleep for 10 seconds. Oh, no, this guy failed. I feel like this one's also going to fail. But yeah, sadly, the demo gods have kicked us this time. Uh, oh, well, that's mostly what we have here. We have the entire Chris system running in Podman desktop. Any questions? Yeah, I have a few. Um, I'm curious, uh, is there anything that Podman could do that would make this easier for you? Yeah, so several things. Podman has pretty much innovated in the space of rootless containers, and that's great because Chris is concerned about security. And we need to make sure that these plugins aren't going to do anything malicious. And if they do something malicious, they can't break out of that container jail. Uh, a second thing is one of the key innovations of the Chris project itself is that Chris plugins, unlike some other systems for computational research, aims to be simple for developers. And I should be able to look at a terminal view here. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the apptainer command. Um, apptainer is another container runtime similar to Docker, Podman, and friends. But this apptainer command could also just be a podman command. And podman would be a great candidate for having people be able to run these analyses on their own systems uh, because podman is rootless and or podman supports rootless mode. Uh, if I can just quickly jump in with a meta uh, comment or observation here. So 
Can you guys all hear me? Is my mic coming through? Yep. Well, so, so one of the things we're trying to do here, right, is um, you know you saw in the Chris UI at the beginning of like a, this this connected graph of containers. So that's kind of at the heart of what we're trying to make bun, you know, distributable, right? So you can you can construct an, an arbitrarily complex tree of computing where each one of those nodes is is obviously a container. Um, and because as you that's a Jennings showed in the beginning, you can have multiple different computing stages as you're doing your whole one of the things we're trying to do is to be able to publish and bundle together the value of that computing tree simply and easily, right? So you can you can describe your entire compute as as a as a simple YAML file, which literally is just describes the tree of computing your your almost your directed acyclic graph, and mostly in research, what folks end up folks end up doing right is they construct their workflows using bash scripts if they get to that level. And you know, as most of us know, bash scripts are horrible to try and do anything with. And most of the coding there is is literally just plumbing, right? You know, it's all to do with data copying from one directory to another and da -da 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 -da, all this kind of stuff. That all goes away in a in a system like this. You know, leveraging Chris which which sits above, you know, something like Podman or Kubernetes, whatever the case may be, all of that goes away, um, which we think is can be pretty useful for reproducible computing and, and science and stuff like that. Um, and another thing which which is maybe just useful to point out over here is, um, so I was at Red Hat Summit last week, and um, there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, about how in industry we can, you know, deploy models of of computing, like AI models. How do we deploy them? And the, uh, as far as I can tell, the industry model to do that is you take a data scientist working in Jupyter Notebook, and that's all they ever do. And then an application engineer or developer comes in and takes her Python Jupyter Notebook and shoves it into a Flask Python uh, framework or Fast API. And that fast API thing you then go and throw on the web and manage with Kubernetes or Podman or whatever the case may be. And that seems to be what most people are doing. And that's there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but it just struck me that what ends up happening there is that you're kind of entrenching the separation between you, the, the primary developer, like the data scientist, and where it's going to be deployed. There's a huge gulf between them, right? The data scientist doesn't know anything about Flask or Fast API, they don't want to touch that. They're not interested in doing that. But in a in a system that we put together over here, the the actual thing that is deployed on the web, that is managed by Podman, that is managed by this whole system, is pretty much the exact code that you as a data scientist develop. So it's so it that 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 delta between your prototype code and the deployed code is much, much shallow, smaller and shallower than what, it, than what is the normal way of doing things. So that's another innovation that we're like, super excited about to do here, right? You can develop your stuff. You can be a data scientist. You don't even have, in, in this case here, you don't even have to know what man, we're doing it all for you with our set up YAML scripts. But you are developing your code, and you're able to deploy it locally on your own machine and pretty much see what it would be like in production at scale. Anyway, uh, just a quick, quick high-end plug here. Well, thanks, uh, Rodolf. Uh, I think that's exactly what we are trying to to accomplish. Uh, it's uh, helping the developers to be able to reproduce locally things that they will run on production. So having something as close as possible from production is super critical to have fast turnarounds when you are building your application, but also when you are consuming it uh, as you use just demos, uh, in fact. So wonderful. The, the demo is fantastic, I think. And it's really nice to see uh, the, the technology being used for such uh, such cases uh, as well. That's, uh, that's really nice. 
So I was able to get what I wanted to show running, uh, which is I just rolled back to an earlier commit that was working. So what I tried to do was I ran a second plugin instance here. And you can see what I did was um, I was trying to run this program called simple DS app with a parameter called sleep length 20. And here we can see the output in Podman desktop as well. So what the Chris system did was once it received the request to run a container, it handles all of the, uh, it handles fudging with the Podman interface for you. And it created a container with heel simple DS app. And here's the output. I'm not sure if we'll be able to inspect it anymore. Yeah, I can't inspect it anymore because Chris decided to delete the container once it was done running. Uh, if it was still running, then you would be able to see the flags here as well. I also wanted to just quickly show off what Rudolph was talking about. So what I was showing here was just the stages of a biomedical compute pipeline. It often involves multiple steps and multiple programs that are going to be glued together by a bash script. If you've ever done any kind of scientific computing, you would understand what I'm talking about. These bash scripts or even CSH scripts are going to be maybe 4,000 lines long of gibberish. Uh, whereas with Chris, how we organize and orchestrate these workflows is using a YAML schema. If I were to pull up my browser again, this is a pipeline that I've been working on, which extracts surfaces, AKA just polygonal mesh representations of the fetal brain cortex from a reconstructed brain image. And so it does some file conversions and it um, processes the left and right hemisphere separately. And this is specified using a declarative YAML syntax instead of bash. Oh, I also wanted to add to what Stefan was talking about. Um, we have Chris deployed and targeting OpenShift container platform Unfortunately, this week, we were just unlucky. Uh, our local cloud that we use, it's called the Massachusetts Open Cloud and the New England Research Cloud. They are doing their yearly power down maintenance, so I can't show that off. Though typically, Chris is um, deployed on OpenShift and also uses OpenShift for its public compute. And one of the things about Podman is it makes it easy where we can have this one set of Kubernetes YAML manifests that work on both OpenShift and also just locally on my desktop. I don't know if I'm supposed to be calling on people, but hello, oh, man. Sure, go ahead. Hi. So my question for you, because I know you guys were previously using Docker Compose, and I just wanted to know how has the transition been um, kind of coming from Docker Compose into this setup? Yeah, um, perhaps we should. I, I know next in the schedule, someone's talking about Quadlet, which is something that we need to look into. Uh, I'll talk about why right now, actually. Using Docker Compose is a lot easier for not necessarily the right reasons. It's because Docker Compose has a insecure by default kind of mode of operand, which is great for developers. But one of the things that I'm curious about is just trying to enforce the principle of least privileges here. And moving into Podman was more difficult because of the daemon listing. We need a daemon to talk, which is why I'm running the Podman socket. Uh, and also the rootlessness thing. There were a few bugs there. But in general, the experience was somewhat good. There are some key differences between how Podman Cube Play works and how the actual Kubernetes system works or how Docker Compose works. The two biggest discrepancies are going to be that Podman Cube Play operates sequentially. What that means is it's going to create one pod, or sorry, one container at a time. And that's a problem when you have containers depending on each other. In the world of Docker Compose or Kubernetes, these containers are going to start 
asynchronously, meaning if the dependencies aren't resolved, they'll just restart in a few seconds. In Podman, I need to do the dependency resolution myself. And how that works is I've prefixed these with numbers denoting the order in which they are dependent. So I need my config maps first. And then I need my database and RabbitMQ uh, services, which my backend is dependent on. And then I have to run my backend near the end because it's dependent on the database and RabbitMQ. Yeah, Brent? I, let me check with Tom first on the time check. How are you feeling, Tom? Um, we've got well, just a few more minutes. I can go five more minutes, but that's going to be pushing. OK. I'm curious then. So when you say that, when you say that before with, uh, I think it was Compose, <clears throat> it's done sort of asynchronously, are you handling, are the containers themselves handling the failure and restarting? Or how is that being negotiated? In Docker Compose, it's possible to specify the dependency order of containers. And that's not a perfect solution, but it is better than sequential. OK. And I think it's also supported in Podman Compose, but we've tried to move off of Podman Compose and into Podman Play Cube. Okay. Yeah, so what you can see is when I'm running the Chris container over here, this is a Docker Compose file. I can increase the font size a bit. Uh, this Chris service is defined with the um, options depends on, and the depends on is a list of other services which must be started before the Chris service. This is good because we can make sure that these other services at least exist prior to Chris. This isn't a complete solution because even though the containers themselves exist, the service might not be ready to accept connections yet. Uh, but still, Docker Compose is able to figure out the dependency order and then start these both asynchronously and in the order that would satisfy the dependency tree. Uh, with Podman, currently, the dependency resolution must be handled manually. This is also somewhat deviant from the Kubernetes spec. Uh, I'm not sure if it's part of the Kubernetes spec, but I would assume so that every resource specified in a YAML file, uh, or sorry, the order of resources specified in a YAML file should not matter. So. What I have here is I have a YAML file of a bunch of Kubernetes resources. They're separated by the triple dash syntax. And in theory, or ideally, the order of these services shouldn't matter. But when you're running it using Podman, whether it be through Podman Desktop or Podman Cube Play, the order does matter. You need to specify the dependencies before the dependence. Okay, thank you. Great. Any further questions? This has been a great presentation, great discussion. Um, I assume Tom has your contact information. If I would want to follow up, you'd yeah. be willing well, to answer. I mentioned, some. um, someone's later going to present on Quadlet. I would be very interested in hearing more about Quadlet because to my understanding, Quadlet is where Podman uses systemd as the orchestrator of some sorts. And so hopefully systemd can sidestep this issue. With Podman Cube, my understanding is Podman is starting these services sequentially. But if we were to define them as systemd unit files, then systemd does start services in parallel. Uh, hopefully this dependency resolution problem goes away. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, the speaker had to back out literally just after the meeting started. So we're not going to be discussing Quadla today, but we can certainly get you in touch with them if you'd like to. Um, Who is the speaker, and, Tom? Dan. Oh. Okay. We can, yeah, we can do, we can arrange something for you. Okay. And then Matt, I've moved you down to the bottom of the um, agenda today, just so we can get to the other things too. And if we don't get to the four or five update, I think we can get by without that. So Perfect. next, fine. okay, next up, Stefan, Podman desktop update. Yeah. So, um, I, 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 I I think the demo that was just done by uh, Jenning was uh, just a, a very cool illustration of how Podman Desktop could be leveraged for helping uh, streamlining container workflows and ensuring smooth uh, and efficient developer experience. So this is great introduction, I would say. Um, so uh, on, the, I'm going to share my screen. So we just announced the version 1.0 of uh, of Podman Desktop, and um, we uh, we released it uh, two weeks ago. And um, in this version, uh, as you might already know, uh, we provide a, a user friendly interface for managing uh, containers and uh, working with Kubernetes directly from a local developer uh, machine. Uh, so there's a bunch of things that we are trying to to do from uh, from Podman Desktop, uh, like uh, abstracting the setup and the configuration of uh, the entire container tooling, so you can create your Podman machine directly from the UI, and you have the ability to uh, to to create your machine with or without root privileges uh, as well. Um, and uh, as uh, as it has been demoed uh, as well, there's capabilities to uh, play Kubernetes YAMLs directly from uh, from uh, from the UI. So you can see your pods, you can see uh, the logs, you can interact with uh, with uh, with each of the containers, and you can get the Kubernetes uh, manifest for uh, for, uh, for for your applications, so you can easily test that onto um, onto uh, onto a Kubernetes environment. So I can take a container and I can say, "Hey, um, I want to run this container inside of a pod." So I can create a pod from my container, run it locally with uh, Podman. And then uh, once I have uh, this, uh, this environment uh, which, is, uh, which is running, once I have my pod running locally with Podman, I can easily deploy that onto a Kubernetes environment. So I can test it onto different Kubernetes environments. And uh, right now, from Podman Desktop, you can uh, create a, a kind cluster, which is a Kubernetes cluster running in uh, in Podman. So you can create uh, the cluster. You will uh, you will have that uh, ND after uh, after few seconds or few few minutes, depending on uh, on the network. And uh, when you are in the context of uh, of your pod and your images, you will have the ability to easily um, interact with the cluster. So you will have the ability to push an image that you built locally uh, with Podman, and you will be able to push that image directly onto the, the kind cluster to use it into a deployment or into a service that you, you want to try out locally. So this is one step, uh, uh, one step further uh, in, in some sense. Once you have your kind cluster, it appears as a container uh, in your list of, uh, of container. So I have it here, ND. 
I can see the logs. And uh, what's uh, pretty uh, interesting is that uh, I can also directly from uh, from, uh, from here I can also interact directly with the with the cluster. So I can um, also do a kubectl command directly from uh, from here. So if I have my pod that I just create, I can say, hey, I want to deploy that pod onto my kind cluster. So it, uh, it, it uses uh, uh, the podman command to generate the Kubernetes manifest. And, uh, and then it selects the Kubernetes context. And I can do the deployment of my pod directly uh, onto, uh, onto my kind uh, environment. So here it's probably pulling the image. And now NGNX is running and I can see my pod running locally in Podman, but I can also see it running on Kubernetes kind cluster uh, here as well. So those are the type of workflows that you you can leverage to make make it easier for you to uh, have your turnarounds and you to, to test your application more easily uh, as well. Um, coming with uh, the version 1.0, we have a, a set of, uh, of extensions. As you know, Podman Desktop is, uh, is, uh, is open to multiple container engine and Kubernetes distributions. So there's compatibility with, uh, with uh, Docker, Lima. And uh, for, um, for Kubernetes, we have integrated kind. But there's also the ability to run OpenShift on your local developer environment. Uh, so you, you, you can directly install the extension from, uh, from, from the screen. And once you have the, uh, the application, uh, the extension installed, you can uh, create an OpenShift local environment. So I already have one, so uh, it's not going to to run, but you have the ability to configure OpenShift local with two different presets. So either you can use um, an OpenShift local, uh, an OpenShift single cluster, single node cluster uh, on your local environment, or you can also use a lightweight version of OpenShift, which is uh, MicroShift that you can run uh, lo lo locally. So this is what uh, what I am running here. And you have the ability to switch your Kubernetes context from kind to uh, MicroShift. So if I have uh, an, an image that I want to deploy to MicroShift, I can also do that directly from, uh, from the list of images. And I can deploy uh, uh, I can deploy uh, pods, I can deploy uh, Kubernetes YAMLs directly onto uh, my MicroShift uh, environment. Uh, we also integrated uh, capabilities for uh, enabling the Docker compatibility mode. So this enable to map the Docker socket directly to, to Podman, but also uh, use the command line that some developers may already be familiar with. Uh, so this is pretty uh, pretty handy uh, as well. So it's available um, today. It's free. Uh, you can download it from uh, podmandesktop.io uh, or podman.io uh, as well. Um, and uh, we are always looking for feedback and new new ideas on things that uh, we could be uh, we could be improving so feel free to engage on uh, the repository as well uh, so you can create issues and you can also report feedbacks directly from within the application so you can share your experience and tell us uh, what are your suggestions uh, as well um, and with this, I think I covered um, 
the intro on Podman Desktop 1.0. Uh, so the launch was two weeks ago. We have been getting uh, a, a very positive feedback from uh, from the community. We had a, a lot of uh, blog posts and uh, media coverage, um, but there is also um, uh, a release announcement that we uh, we published on uh, developers.redat.com. Uh, so feel free to to give a to give a look uh, if you are interested. Otherwise, uh, looking for hearing uh, your feedback and your thoughts on the product. Any questions? Not a question, but could you um, share the Podman.io site real quick, Stefan? Sure. You have it up there just for a moment. I just did want to mention that we have Mo here, and that, that has been revamped greatly by her and other folks, and it's looking phenomenal right now. Yeah, it's the, the new website is looking fantastic. Uh, so kudos to uh, to Mo, uh, uh, who, who has been working on this uh, quite heavily, and uh, it's uh, it's I think what Podman was deserving. So. Really cool to see. Yes. Thank you. And thank you once again, Mo. It really is great. All right. With that, we're going to move on to Lokesh talking about Podman S6. All right. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Stefan, could you stop sharing, please? Sure. Um, Oh. All right. Uh, I guess you can see my screen. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, so first off, uh, what's the problem at hand? So as a system administrator, I would like to confine each user to a predefined shell environment. And in that environment, a user would have access to volumes and capabilities specified for that particular user. Now, what is Podman SH? Podman SH is an executable user bin Podman SH, along with a container by the same name, Podman SH. Now, this container is managed by a user quadlet. With the login shell set to the Podman SH executable, when the user logs into the system, they enter the Podman SH container directly. Now, let me do a quick demo. So, First, let's check who the current user is. Uh, so that's the current user with the shell set to bin bash. Now, I have created a demo user for this purpose. Now, this demo user has shell set to user bin pod minus uh, Also, let's see the user quadlet created for this demo user. Oops. So this is a basic quadlet that's been created for the user. The, the image has been set to UBI 9 minimal. Um, now, let me first see what host I'm on. I'm on Fedora release 38. Now, I'll SSH into the system as a demo user. Okay. So I'm SSH in um, and as the user demo and the environment is a rel environment as was specified in the quadlet file. Uh, so current status of this work, uh, this is still work in progress. There is an open PR, I'll link to it in HackMD. Uh, now this might get into 4.6 as a tech preview, but it should be ready for the release after 4.6. And that's my demo, questions? All right, uh, yeah, Tom, back to you. Great, well, Kesh, thank you, that was great. And Matt, do you want to give us a quick rundown on what's happening with 4.5? 
Uh, honestly, I think I'll just take the opportunity to go on to four, six and future release plans because four five is this point is two months old. So, uh, generally speaking, we are planning at least one more release this summer, but there's still discussion going on in the team as to whether we're going to do two, one end of this month and one somewhere in August or just, uh, just one release, which would be probably mid to late July. So we're not completely sure on this, but you are getting at least a 4.6 and potentially a 4.7 by end of summer. We're hoping to firm this up and get an actual document out that will describe future release cadence at some point, but that's still being worked on. As to what you can expect in 4.6, generally speaking, improvements to Podman Machine, especially around Mac and Windows, improvements to Quadlet, and just general bevy of bug fixes as you as you usually get. Also, at some point, maybe not 4.6, but some point in the future, we are going to be making the new SQLite database backend the default still needs to be discussed if it's mature enough to do that in 4.6. This should just be only for new installations, so I don't expect any significant changes from a user perspective, but that is something to look out for. And I think that's about it. I could go into four or five features, but again, it's two months old, and at our current cadence, that is uh, ancient history. Now that's fine by me. Brent, did you have anything to say? You look like you had something you wanted to say. Oh, no, but I can add to it. Um, okay. We're currently just sort of looking at what we're working on, where uh, Matt hit a lot of it. Uh, we're working on some final pieces for Netavark uh, parity with CNI. Um, and in terms of machine, uh, I currently have two new hypervisors in flight um one is hyper v for windows and the second is the apple hypervisor their native one rather than qmu um, both are progressing nicely um, because they're new platforms for fedora core os it, they, it does have to go through a rather lengthy process and get into their release process to where images would be automatically created. Um, but a lot of that code will be in 4.6 and potentially for those chomping at the bit, they can check out if it fixes or solves any problems. One very good thing I'm happy to report is we have Vert IOFS working on the Apple hypervisor part and it's quite fast. Um, I think that's it, Matt. Yeah, uh, sounds about right to me. Uh, we'll have full release notes at some point prior to the actual release and hopefully sometime by end of the week we should have more details on whether we're getting just 4.6 or 4.6 and 4.7 by end of summer. Yes, of course, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask if you if you are looking for um, people who want to test the uh, the work on the uh, native hypervisors. If you are seeking for uh, for uh, more testers from the community uh, or not yet. I will, but not yet. Uh, okay. On the Hyper V side. Um, we need, we need ignition upstream to merge and start creating some images. I could do one offs, but it's not something I like to do. The second piece is the, um, socket mapping for Hyper-V has not been completed. Um, so it, it would make it more difficult for people to actually use in that regard on the Apple. On the Apple side, we're still working out. Um, I'm actually sort of faking out ignition right now, and that's how I'm doing the testing. But we're um, we're basically same thing there. No socket mapping yet, and we need ignition to merge when the work's done. Okay. 
and I'm going fishing next week, so it won't be in the next week. Don't catch any selkies, please. All right. Um, that's it for our plan topics. We have just a few minutes left for open forum questions. Does anybody have any questions or comments they want to make? We love to hear what we're not doing right. Yes. And also any topics that you'd like to see for the next meeting, which I'll just say real quickly. Our next meeting is August 1st, 2023. That's a Tuesday. That's the first Tuesday of August. That'll be at 11 a.m. again. And our next cabal meeting is not up on me because we do that on the third Thursday of the month, and that's on the 15th this, this time around. So that'll be next Thursday. So if you have any topics for either of those, let me know. And currently, the Quadlet demo will be on that list for the community meeting in August. And I'm not hearing any other questions, comments? Comments? I think it's super cool, everything that is happening in the Comet Podman community at the moment. So yes. thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, your engagement, involvement. It's amazing. Yes. It's I if I can, at the 11th hour, ask a question. Um, I uh, actually met with Dan um, at Red Hat Summit, and he's very aware of the stuff we're doing with a major financial um, that very much wants uh, ALS, if you move the ultimate layer storage, kind of whatever. Um, uh, Dan suggests I present to the group on it. I won't be able to, I don't know if I'll be on the 15th, but what's one after the 15th? What, what's the meeting date after the 15th? Um, the one is, there's the Podman community meeting on August 1st, but there's another one, another cabal meeting. And if I can get my calendar up, I tell you it's the third Thursday in July. All right. Well, I'll reach out to you. Dan sent an email between you and I. So I'll follow up on that. Um, okay. Really, what, I, what, what my curiosity is, is right now the ALS is considered experimental in storage, um, in the container storage. Um, any suggestions on, besides what the things I talked with Dan about, about moving it forward to not being experimental? <laughs> like documentation, <laughs> things like that. Brent, can I throw that one in your lap? Yeah, I was just waiting to see if anyone piped up. So Jerry, uh, you're the one then? I'm, I'm the one, if you've heard about the people screaming about it. I heard about them. Yeah. Um, I guess for a I'd have to think about that. It's an interesting question. Um, what is I'm I'm not deeply familiar with what, what's held it back other than the fact that it's fairly new. But not a new technology, but a new ad. Yeah, it's 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 deployed. It works. Um in the you know, it's it's uh 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 Dan suggested uh add, you know submitting some documentation. The only place I could imagine to document it is in the storage.conf man page because there's, there's no commands associated with it. Um, maybe you have some other thoughts on that. I've written that up. I just haven't submitted it yet. Okay. Um, it works. Um, it's really just a matter of fear of commitment um, because other than myself, a group at nt and uh, um, and then some other miscellaneous projects. I don't think anybody, I don't know how many people are using it. Uh, let me let me get back to you, but um, I wondered if there were, you said there was documentation in container storage. No, there is, there is not. I, I, oh, I okay. wrote some up that I can submit. And it really okay. just, I mean, if you, if the, the other technology is the, you know, the alternate image store, and that literally has two lines of documentation. Um, I wrote a couple of paragraphs, which is probably too much, but, um, well, regardless, that would be good to have, um, I think beginning to blog about it would be smart it, and we can provide a, a blogging resource if you're interested. Yep. Dan suggested that. Do you have, do you have my con contact information? Yeah, it's in the calendar notice, I would assume. Okay, 
So I don't have your contact information, so if you could ping me, I'll respond. Absolutely. Thank you, Brooke. All right, folks, unless there's any last questions, we're almost at time for this meeting. I'd like to very much thank all the presenters today for coming in and showing off this stuff. It was a fascinating look at a lot of things today. And again, we'll be meeting next on August 1st and then on July 20th, or June 15th and July 20th in the next couple of meetings. So folks, with that, I'm going to stop the recording.